Welcome. My name is Kevin Featherstone, and I'm director of the Hellenic Observatory here at the LSE. The observatory is hosting today's event. Our panel discussion is part of a program of events to commemorate the 200th anniversary of the Greek War of Independence. A number of universities and societies across the UK are collaborating in this initiative, and it's led by my colleague, Professor Gonda Van Steen at King's College uh, London. You can get more information about the future events uh, by going to the website 21 in 21, where 21 in 21 is in numerical figures. The year 1821 unleashed, of course, a new wave of Hellenism across Europe. We championed freedom and independence and other nations were born. We also embraced the new Hellenism to define who we are. Indeed, the normative identity of Europe and of the West was fundamentally defined by what we ascribed to the Greek legacy. We had invited Paul Cartledge to in, uh, join our discussion today. Unfortunately, for personal reasons, he's had to withdraw. And we sent him our very best uh, personal uh, wishes and look forward to inviting him on a future occasion to the LSE. But by way of introducing today's topic, I'm going to borrow and interpret some of the points he'd intended to make. Let me rephrase four of his points. Firstly, every youngster learns that democracy is a Greek word, combining demos and kratos. Kratos meant unambiguously might, power, strength, force, which could be used for good or ill. Demos, however, was ambiguous. It could mean all the Greek people. In the uh, Greek terms at the time, the empowered adult male citizen, or just a section of them. Therefore, the opponents of Democratia, like Plato, could see it as a dictatorship of the poor over the elite. Others saw it as a matter of freedom and equality. Then, as now, there were concerns about people power, but also of unaccountable power. Unlike today, all ancient versions of democracy were direct, transparent, and face-to-face. -face. The assembly, or ecclesia, called elected officials to account and the people's juric courts could overturn the legality of decisions made. Power was not unchecked. But democracy was not just a matter of institutions, but also of education and culture. Democracy in Athens went hand in hand with the city scaling cultural heights achieved by no other Greek, ancient Greek city, and perhaps uh, hardly any other city or country since. In other words, democracy had wider underpinnings. To be a citizen was to be engaged and aware. And democracy in ancient Greece took many different forms. We don't have a surviving text from that period that gives a thorough conceptually reasoned case for democracy by a, a convinced ancient Greek democrat. Almost every writer on ancient democracy that we know of was more or less hostile to it. So it's arguable how much singularity there is in the Greek inheritance to guide us on the specifics today. The ancients struggled with the relationship between power and the people. Pericles wielded power, but of course had no impunity and was deposed amidst the, the perils of the Peloponnesian War. Those around him were attacked with allegations of personal corruption. The standards we expect from our leaders then and now remain contestable. Today, we use the Greek leg legacy to legitimize and identify ourselves as upholders of democratic values. We idealize our Greek inheritance to show who we are. But are our leaders today living up to that idealized notion? Or are they vulgarizing politics, breaking established norms of behavior, of honesty, 
and unleashing anti-democratic spirits? Are they heeding the concerns of some of the ancient Greeks, at least, regarding what today we might call populism and demagoguery? So our discussion could hardly be more topical. I'm going to pass now to my colleague, Paul Kelly, Professor Paul Kelly from the London School of Economics to guide us through the discussion. Paul is a noted professor of political theory, well-versed in talking about democracy and the legitimacy of power. And I will leave you in his very capable hands. And like you, I look forward to the discussion. Paul. Thank you very much, Kevin, for that wonderful introduction. So hello, everybody, and welcome to this LSE panel discussion. As Kevin said, my name is Paul Kelly. I'm a professor in the government department at the London School of Economics, and I'm a political theorist by um, persuasion and by training. Um, today's panel is on power and impunity. What Donald Trump and Boris didn't learn from the ancient Greeks. And it's been well summed up in Kevin's presentation um, and reference to um, the ideas of Paul Cartledge, who was hoping to be with us today. We have a distinguished panel to address these questions about whether we're living in a new world marked by an impunity of power and how our ideas and notions of the good society and responsibility that comes with power and democracy and its discourse are situated in relation to its Greek sources. Pericles, Socrates, Plato, or Aristotle, who've shaped our political thinking, our processes, and our understanding of political orders. And in terms have had an impact on what we consider the Western values that underpin our democratic culture. So is this no longer of use or value? Are we judging? the utility and costs of present circumstances by different standards. This panel brings together some experts who can address some of these issues from different starting points. And therefore I'd like to introduce today's panel. So first of all, I'm grateful to um, Professor Simon Goldhill. Simon is Professor of Greek at the University of Cambridge. He's the Foreign Secretary of the British Academy. He's written extensively on Greek society and the culture of ancient democracy. His books have been translated into more than 10 languages and he's won more than three international prizes. He's lectured and broadcast on television and the radio all over the world from Canada to China. A second panel member joining us from the United States is Johanna Hannick. Associate Professor of Classics at Brown University in Rhode Island and co-editor of the Journal of Modern Greek Studies. Her work focuses on classical Athens and the modern reception of Greek antiquity. She's the author of Lycurgan Athens and the Making of Classical Tragedy and Classical Debt, Greek Antiquity in an Era of Austerity. She's also translator of ancient and modern Greek and her volume, Andreas Karkavitsas, The Archaeologist and Selected Sea Stories is due out in 2021. A third member of the panel from the home team is Professor Michael Cox, founding director of LSE Ideas. He was appointed to a chair at LSE in 2002 and helped establish the Cold War Studies Center at LSE in 2004 with Arnie Westad, and later they were both founding directors of LSE Ideas. Professor Cox has lectured to universities worldwide, as well as to several government bodies and to many private companies. He's currently visiting professor at Catholic University in Milan. He's an author, editor, and co-editor of more than 30 books, including most recently a collection of his essays, The Post-Cold War World, as well as new editions of John Maynard Keynes's The Economic Consequences of the Peace and E.H. Carr's Nationalism and After. 
He's now working on a new history of the LSE entitled The School, LSE and the Shaping of the Modern World. Before turning into our panel, um, can I just say that for those of you who are following us on Twitter, the hashtag for today's event is hash LSE Greece. We are recording this event and hopefully it will be made available as a video and podcast subject to no technical difficulties. And we will follow the panel presentations with a Q&A session. So there'll be a chance for you to put your questions to panelists or to raise general questions across the whole panel. To submit your questions, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. For those watching the event live on Facebook, please add um, them as comments. Questions will be submitted to myself and I'll pose as many as possible to the speakers. Could I ask those um, who do submit questions if you would give us your name and your affiliation, so if you're an LSE student, an alumni, or from another university or somewhere else in the world, and also as it's interesting for the rest of those um, following this, if you could tell us where you're joining us from. So with that, can I ask Simon to start us off with his presentation? Simon. Thanks, Paul, very much. The first thing I want to say is it cannot be stressed too much how weird democracy is. That's to say, we tend to take it for granted these days that it normatively, ideally, it's almost the only game in town. But historically, it's extremely rare. And the idea that we should turn power away from individuals into a group of people, a group of people who may not know each other, is really very odd. And I want to use that sense of oddness. That's why we just study ancient Greek after all. It's not just to find some genealogy of morals, but to find a mirror in which we can understand something about ourselves through that sort of uh, fantasy of idealism that Paul was talking about, Paul Cartledge. And I want to use two particular ideas today to try and get some sense of that oddity. The first thing is to think about what democracy isn't for the ancient Greeks. And if there is a bugbear of democracy, the opposite of democracy, for the ancient Greeks, it tended to be the word tyranny, the tyrant. And what's interesting about the notion of the tyrant is that it developed a complete uh, idea of itself. It was like a topos, a, a set of cliches by which you could recognize a tyrant. One of the most important ways that you recognized a tyrant was by the failure of communication. And the failure of communication meant simply that because of power, because of power being invested in one person, the tyrant, this changed the dynamics of interaction between men. And it was men, of course. What it meant is that if you were not the tyrant, you were forced to fawn, is the word people used, synane in Greek. It meant that you couldn't speak the truth. You couldn't speak truth to power because power was an imbalance. At the same time, what followed from that was that the tyrant was forced, therefore, to mistrust all those around him because he knew that they were fawning and he knew that they were not speaking truth to power. What that meant was that communication was, for the tyrant, always flawed. Now, what it also led towards is violence. However a tyrant came to power, it was always retrospectively seen as an act of violence. And how a tyrant left power was undoubtedly violence. One of the oddest things about the recent events in America is that people were surprised that the tyrant ended in violence. But what the question that is, arises from that is, what is the place of dissent? within government. And if we want to learn something from that negative view of democracy, it's the awkwardness of finding the place of dissent. We know that under the recent arguments to do with Brexit, we saw a similar tests of loyalty amongst the government members. 
and a sense that you were always only for or against. And that notion of where do we place dissent has become one of the defining issues of current democracy. This is not simply a question for whether we find dissent in Parliament and whether we allow nuanced argument in Parliament. It's also to do with where do we locate protest? What is the adequate, what is the correct form of protest as an expression of power? It is almost taken for granted somehow that protest is a good thing because it's the weak expressing themselves to power. Isn't protest already a sign of the failure of democracy? Isn't protest already the sign that the institutions designed to deal with dissent are not working? So one of the things we might think about in terms of power and impunity, following on from this model of the tyrant, might be how do we negotiate dissent within a community? I would say that every community must have conflict. That is to say, it is impossible for me to imagine a city without conflict within it. Now that might not be war, but it is likely to be conflict between the rich and the poor, between men and women, between, in our society, different races or groups. The question is not, can we aim towards a society of absolute harmony, but how do we negotiate that difference? How do we work together? The question for the impunity of power then is how do we deal with dissent institutionally within a community? And if you wanted me to express one way in which I think we've learned something about the failure of current democratic politics, it would be the institutional failure to deal with dissent in a creative and productive manner. That is my first point. My second point, however, is a more embarrassing one for us, for us good, liberal, academic, intelligent chaps. One of the things we know all too well is that we have learned to say, experts, follow the experts. We do that quite a lot. We make fun of Donald Trump for being inexpert, but so much. We make fun of Boris blundering around saying, I'm following the science. And we look at ourselves very knowingly and say, the science as if, and we can do all those moves. We know how to play the game of expertise. And as experts, we support our own position because that's what we are, experts. The person who first put expertise on the table in the context of democracy was Plato. Plato is the person who gave us the logic of epistemology we still use. As David has said, to do philosophy is to speak Greek, and he's right. That is to say that if we believe in truth, opinion, true opinion, false opinion, one of the things we're doing is following platonic epistemology. Plato is the person who invented those terms, put them on the table and made them into a structured system. When we laugh as we must, at people who say uh, that Donald Trump had a legitimate belief that the election was rigged. We have to say, yes, of course, legitimate belief, ridiculous idea, ridiculous category. But when we're doing that, what we're doing is buying into platonic epistemology because it is the game in town. That's all we have. Where does platonic epistemology lead? Platonic epistemology is completely integral with authoritarian politics. It is not by chance that Plato was the fam favorite philosopher of both Hitler and Stalin. That is to say that if you commit yourself to expertise as a value, I wonder to what degree you are being undemocratic. After all, it is precisely the platonic attack on democracy that we allow people to make decisions, not experts. He comes in and says, if you want a shoemaker to make a shoe, you have an expert. If you want a shoe mended, you go to an expert. Why would you imagine that doing politics, you wouldn't have a political expert? Why should we turn to the people? The argument that values expertise, that depends on an epistemology, leads towards censorship, towards authoritarian government 
towards the ideal city that cannot allow change or difference or mess. So the second thing we might wonder about when we talk about power and impunity would be to think about have we moved to the world where Plato's critique of democracy also seems self-evident to us, that we should have experts making political decisions. And if we have moved towards that position, and if we've used that perhaps unthinkingly in recent arguments, I wonder whether we're prepared to face the consequences that it's us that are being undemocratic. It's us that are not trusting the people. It's us that are not allowing the whole logic of democracy, which is the large collection of people together will make the best decision. So it seems to me that one of the things we might learn from, uh, from ancient Greece is simply how confused we still are about democracy and what a very strange model of democracy we have, where we're prepared to elect people to rule for us who we haven't met, who we barely know, and who make decisions for us without us testing their expertise at all. We seem to have absorbed some weird platonic critique and then turned it into a messed up system. And that's the one we praise to the skies. I wonder why. I think one of the figures we might need is a little bit of Aristophanes to remind us of how funny we are when we think we've got politics right. Thanks. Thank you very much, Simon. Um, some very interesting ideas there, especially for the LSE. Um, okay, with that, can I now ask Joanna to um, uh, give her talk? Well, thank you to Professor Featherstone, Professor Kelly, and to my fellow panelists. It's a real privilege to be in such illustrious company and to take part in this event especially since it inaugurates, as Professor Featherstone mentioned, a whole year's worth of programming um, around what is really is a Megali Epetios, the Greek bicentennial. So Britain's current prime minister is rather better known than the US's newest former president for his love of the classics, and especially of ancient Greece. A bust of Pericles, which Johnson is said to have toted around with him since university, apparently now graces number 10. Johnson's official biographer is on the record as saying that the bust is, quote, partly a joke, but also serious as well. Five years ago, Johnson faced off with Mary Beard in a debate over that most pressing of all modern questions, Greece or Rome? Johnson spoke for Greece, and while Beard and Rome took the knife, it wasn't for his lack of conviction. In fact, every so often, a clip of him reciting the first lines of Homer's Iliad in Greek occasionally resurfaces on the internet, and it sets Twitter a titter. Trump, on the other hand, did not exactly build his brand on his mastery of dactylic examiner. And yet, he and his entourage also made their fair share of classical headlines. In just late December, one of the last executive orders that Trump signed, an order titled Promoting Beautiful Federal Civic Architecture, designated classical as the preferred style for all new US federal buildings. So what we have here is two wealthy, elite, straight white men who come from radically different social and educational backgrounds on opposite shores of an ocean, but who ultimately speak the same language, that of Western civilization. And oddly enough, they also happen to share a common idiom when they speak that language with their allusions to ancient Greece. So this panel invites us to think about what, for all their admiration of ancient Greece, Trump and Johnson seem to have failed to learn from the ancient Greeks. And I think it's worth pausing though, to reflect for a moment about that premise. By ancient Greeks, I think more or less what is meant is the classical Athenians. And more specifically, the classical Athenians of the elite white male Western imaginary. These are not the Greeks as they were imagined by the ancient Romans or the Greeks of the Abbasid Caliphate and its great translation movement, or even the Greeks of the American founding fathers, most of whom would have shuddered at the mere mention of Athenian direct democracy. 
What we are being asked to consider today, I think really is the Greeks of our Western Civ textbooks. Those cultural heroes who supposedly, as Stephen Fry once said on a London stage, brought about, quote, the rise of everything that our culture now depends on. So you can imagine what he meant, philosophy, theater, democracy, political theory, empiricism, rational thought, the spirit of scientific inquiry, the list goes on like that. So this panel I think is in some ways really asking us to measure Trump and Johnson against the imaginary superhero Greeks of the West's founding myths and to mock them for falling so short. There is of course, I'll admit, no lack of low hanging fruit. When Johnson was hospitalized for COVID, the media rushed to point out how much he had failed to learn from the example of his own hero, Pericles, who died from the plague that had descended upon Athens early in the Peloponnesian War. So today we could smugly insist that the Athenians knew the importance of political accountability for every public official in classical Athens underwent a rigorous audit when his term was done. And the Athenians also had a process called Aesangelia, which was used for prosecuting in the case of alleged unconstitutional acts, illegal acts, a type of indictment that is often compared to the American impeachment process. And we might go on to point out that had Trump studied the oligarchic coups in Athens of 411 and 403 BCE, he might have had a sharper sense that democracy can regain its balance even after a serious wobble. We could go still farther and suggest that there are more abstract lessons to be drawn from the Athenians ones which might not have even been wholly apparent to the Athenians themselves. That, for example, once you start shouting about how your country needs to be made great again, as Aristophanes, Isocrates, and Demosthenes all did, it's a good sign that the party is already pretty well over. So I won't deny that I have found myself intellectual interest in these kinds of connections. But with all due respect, I think that to dwell on such lessons ones that we in this Zoom room, as opposed to those lesser minds on Downing Street and I guess the Mar-a-Lago fairway now, have supposedly learned from the Greeks, is to undersell this occasion's potential. So what, for what few minutes remain to me, I want to do two slightly different things that I hope you won't find too off track. First, I want to tell you one way in which my understandings of the Greeks and these last years in politics have come to mutually inform each other. Second, I want to propose a critical framework for these proceedings. So first, I've come to think that if there is anything to be learned by laying classical Athens and recent history side by side, it is that societal fictions are precisely that, fictions, and that they are really fragile. In book two of his history of the Peloponnesian War, Thucydides describes the ritualized pomp of the Athenian state funerals for the war dead, then summons forth the great Pericles to deliver a funeral oration. The rendition of that speech has been hailed as testimony to the Athenian miracle, a kind of charter document for Western democracy. Yet that directly precedes another scene, a description of the plague that soon afterwards devastated Athens, which makes the mirage dissipate like so much smoke. The world that the name Athens signifies today was even then a fantasy world. And so too is the world signified by say the word America. In 1935, the poet Langston Hughes issued the call, let America be America again. In a poem that was punctuated by the refrain, America never was America to me. There's a journalistic legend that when Gandhi was asked what he thought of Western civilization, he responded, quote, I think it would be a very good idea. In antiquity, there were surely countless residents of Athens for whom the city never was, well, Athens. And in the end, that means that Athens has really never been more than a very good idea. So let's remember that here. Now for a suggested critical framework. It is a really a privilege to be taking part in an event that kicks off a year of programming around the Greek bicentennial. The American bicentennial in 1976 was of a very different character than its previous anniversary celebrations had been. The bicentennial in America occurred hard on the heels of the civil rights movement and only a year after the end of the Vietnam War. There were many Americans who questioned just what the US had to be celebrating. Already in 1971, anti-war activist Jeremy Rifkin had formed a People's Bicentennial Commission and that movement ultimately led to Howard Zinn's Radical People's History of the United States, which was published in 1980. And in fact, Greece has been seeing a similar balance of celebration from above and critique from below. Just this week, I saw a call for papers for a conference in Greece that seeks to focus on the people's history of the revolution. 
So what does all of this have to do with us here? We might begin by asking ourselves and discussing in the discussion section, why a year of events around the Greek bicentennial should begin with a panel that completely skirts anything to do with the modern nation of Greece, and which instead invites us to critique Boris on his own Philhellenic, though I'm also just tempted to say the word chomocratic terms. Johnson's Philhellenism and the vaguely Philhellenic flavor of these proceedings causes me to wonder if 2021 might not then be a very good year as well to reflect upon and critique the course that Anglo-American Philhellenism has taken over the last two centuries. So let's just review some highlights very quickly. The London Greek Committee was formed in 1823 to support the Greek independence cause, but it also facilitated the brokerage of the so-called independence loans that set the Greek nation on the endless cycle of debt that it still runs around today. A century later, David Lloyd George and his Philhellenic circle secretly supported an attempt at Greek expansion into Ionia and urged on the Greek invasion of Asia Minor that ultimately ended with the so-called Asia Minor catastrophe of 1922. And much more recently, in 2009, a letter to then President Obama signed by hundreds of, dis of distinguished scholars of antiquity rebuked the American president for his administration's recognition of the Republic of Macedonia on the grounds that ancient Macedonia had in fact been Greek. That letter came to be cited by Golden Dawn supporters as evidence that the classical scholarly establishment supports their nationalist and ethnic supremacist claims. So this year, I think, would be a very appropriate one for rethinking how the lofty ideals of Philhellenism have intersected both with the fictions of antiquity and the truths of modern history in ways that have harmed and affected real people. Scholar Dimitris Planzos has insightfully noted that already by the later 19th century, quote, it had become abundantly clear that Philhellenism was a corollary of other people's nationalism. So he means of other people besides the Greeks. One example he raises is that of the excavations at Olympia, which were run by a German team that, quote, advertised the site as an honorific monument to their own nation. So then in asking what lessons Trump and Johnson have failed to learn from the ancient Greeks, I suspect that in a way we're really just asking how they have failed to slot themselves smoothly into a Western civilization narrative. As I at least learned it in high school, that, that narrative starts on the heights of the Acropolis and the Pnyx and is supposed to finish more or less with the end of history by which Francis Fukuyama meant the inevitable and ultimate triumph of Anglo-American liberal democracy. But I think we owe it to ourselves and we owe it to the fantasy that Athens might one day still be possible to use today to think more critically than that. Thank you. Okay, um, well, first of all, uh, I, I think I stand almost on the shoulders of giants, three who have just gone before me. And I make a disclaimer straight away that uh, I am certainly not a classicist in the sense that Simon and Joanna are, uh, but I would want to pick up a couple of things that both of them said very quickly. First of all, I think Joanna's uh, health warning, I think is very, very, very well uh, taken. Uh, it's something which I think when I'm thinking about this from my own perspective, I think the celebration of Greece should not be a, a whitewash, to put it rather bluntly, of much of what has happened in, in that name. And I think some of the things you picked out there Joanna, are, are extraordinarily important. I was going to start my own comments by pointing out that certainly one of the things we don't learn from Aristotle is about the necessity of slavery. Um, I thought he thought of natural slavery. So I think, again, when we're engaging with Greece, uh, for all the reasons that we do, and we'll continue to do, no doubt, uh, and nonetheless, we've got to keep that kind of underside, that darker side, uh, the problematic side, very much in, uh, in, in our minds. So thank you for, the, for, the, for those points. I think they're very well taken. Uh, and picking up on Simon's uh, uh, wonderful intervention too, um, uh, it, the point that Simon makes is a, is a very profound one. How rare is it? In fact, when I think of my own peculiar and strange country called the United Kingdom, which may not be so united in about five years' time, by the way, Simon, um, I kind of think of the, uh, when did Britain become a democracy? And I kind of think, well, I look at the 19th century and I can't think that it was very democratic then, even though we were home to the mother of all parliaments. Uh, did it become a democracy in 1918 with the relatively 
uh, important extension of the franchise. Not really, because so many people were still excluded. Did it become a democracy in 1928? So even the home of democracy or the mother of all parliaments, which is supposed to represent the democratic norm in the West, when did it actually become one? And of course, some Republicans out there would certainly say it isn't one yet, while as long as we have a, a royal family and the whole thing, the baggage that goes with that. But again, Simon, if you look around the world, I mean, yes, democracies have now become the norm in terms of there are more democracies in the world today if you do standard political science, which I know Paul Kelly does. If you look where we were in 1900, look where we have become by the year 2000, more countries in the world define themselves as democratic democracies. But if you kind of look underneath all that, there's some really big problems, really very big problems. What about illiberal democracies? What about countries where the vote can be bought? What about democracies in which elites and even certain single groups or individuals can be elected, but nonetheless still retain power forever and ever and ever, amen. I mean, I don't want to mention Russia in this context. There are other examples of it, but I do think that again, raises a big, big question about what we mean by democracy, how easy we can sometimes use it, Paul, and how we need to examine beneath that facade in order to get to, I think, what I think would call the truth. Moreover, how effective are democracies? And it seems to me in the, in the moment that we now find ourselves in the period of COVID, let us just call it that for the moment, even the era of COVID, it feels like to me here in London at the moment, I think a lot of people are asking not just about democracy, but also about competence, sheer competence. And I think a lot of people are beginning to judge a number of countries in the world, even if they prefer democracy theoretically, and in the end, one does prefer democracy. I do, and I'm sure Simon and Johanna does. Nonetheless, when you look at the issues of competence, you start looking around the world, and one country emerges rather interestingly as being highly undemocratic, uh, formally anti-democratic, and that's China. Now, China, I know, has had a game of two halves when it's come to COVID, uh, did it begin there? Did it, did it spread from China? Fine, we can go back and look into the origins of it. But the way that a highly illiberal uh, polity has dealt with COVID uh, is remarkable. Um, what is even more problematic, and this is not my argument in favour of the Chinese Communist Party, but it's simply a statement of fact. What is even more problematic, Simon, from the point of view of democracy and its legitimacy and how people view democracy is how badly the Anglo-Saxon democracies have done uh, over the last, uh, last year. And that seems to me will raise big questions, not that democracies shouldn't be the norm, but also competence itself should become much more of a norm within a debate uh, about uh, democracy. The next question I wanna raise very quickly, I lived in Northern Ireland, by the way, for many, many years, 20 years I was at Queens, uh, very, very happy times, oddly enough, throughout the troubles between 1972 and 1994, when I finally left. Uh, interesting period to arrive there, an interesting period to leave when the peace process was just about to break out. But I remember in the 1980s, uh, after Sinn Féin was beginning to get a, a very large amount of, of support within Northern Ireland, particularly in certain, certain communities. And then Sinn Féin uh, MPs started, Sinn Féin representatives, started to get elected. And I remember an editorial in the, in the Economist at the time following, it was in the west of, west of Northern Ireland in Fermanagh, and said, democracies is all right, as long as the right people win. Which was kind of an interesting way of putting it, it seems to me, that it's a very fine system as democracy, as long as people we like, we prefer, win, win the actual elections. And of course, obviously the Economist was not supporting uh, the election of, 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 of Sinn Féin candidates uh, at the time. And that comment, which is always stuck in my mind, it's a great thing as long as the right people win, takes me to 2016. And what I, you might call it, the, some might call it the Annus Horribilis, uh, the Annus Oddity, I don't know what you want to call it, but something happened in 2016, did it not? I always like to think in dates of tipping point moments, 89, end of Cold War, 2001, 2008, economic crisis. But I'm putting 2016 right at the heart of tipping point years in the history of, of uh, the thing we call the West, because in June, the British people, unfortunately, 
it, it seemed to many people voted to leave the European Union. It seemed to me a completely irrational decision from an economic point of view, we were told. And guess what? Only a few months later, the American people, by, by a margin, a small margin to be sure, um, elected, elected uh, Donald Trump, which took me back to that, that wonderful phrase, you know, democracy is a very fine thing as long as the right people and you get the right people are elected or you get the right outcomes from it. And I think that brings me back to the sort of points you were raising, Simon, about how we should view democracy, how we should think about democracy, and how in particular should those of us who think about democracy, how should we think about populism? And I've kind of written on populism and tried to reflect on the nature of populism. And I think we have, if I might call it out, a somewhat deeply ambiguous relationship to populism. Because after all, many populists themselves, as we saw in Brexit, as we saw with Donald Trump, although he's no longer in power, but he was elected, they are elected democratically, but we don't like the outcome. And I think that here's a huge problem for what I would call liberals and many others of an open mind when confronted with outcomes and results democratically arrived at, which they, which they don't particularly like. And I think this is a real open question for many of us um, today about not only happens when you know, the wrong people are elected, but how do we then deal with populism? And I, I feel this might come back to the questions that you raised, Simon, and you raised, Johanna, about how, how would the Greeks have dealt with this, whichever Greeks one is here talking about. I'm sure Plato may have thought, well, this is the problem. You know, when you, when you have democracy, it's going to lead to some very dodgy people having the vote, and those people, ignorant masses, if you like, will then elect the wrong kinds of people. Maybe Plato could have predicted Donald Trump. I don't know if you, if you go with that, because it's, it's, a mad, it's a mad point, but you get what I'm trying to get at. And when I was looking at Plato again recently, and again, never claim the expertise that either of you have, I was kind of struck by how much within Plato about its fear of democracy seems to come out in the whole debate about populism today. Because it does seem to me that many liberals today, while they parade their democratic credentials, have a real problem then dealing with outcomes of elections, which in a sense bring people into office or in, into influential positions of power, who are not the right people and then say things you don't particularly don't particularly like. And I think over the last four years, I think liberals, maybe many of us at LSE, Paul, going back to the LSE, you know, have had a huge problem, I think, philosophically, ethically, and politically, uh, dealing with this, this, this particular phenomenon. And it's all very well to hold our nose, as many people have done. I'm not saying Paul has or I have. You know, hold one's nose and say, my goodness me, these ignoramuses, these deplorables. Who used that phrase, by the way, in 2016? They've got elect, you know, you know, and I think we've got to be extraordinarily careful how, how we deal with this. And I think that I also want to make this point, because I'm, I'm mainly using it on the contemporary situation. I still think what happened in with the election, going back to America, Jonah, to the, to the United States and also to the election of, of Joe Biden, which I, I, I'll be perfectly honest, I think was a good thing, don't get me wrong. Nonetheless, you're still left thinking that over 73, 74 million people voted uh, for Donald Trump. And in our own country, back in, two, in the late uh, period of 2019, uh, the British people voted overwhelmingly for a party promising Brexit. Um, and we are still living with that. So again, I, I just wonder from our own point of view, how we, academics, liberals, social democrats, whatever, how we kind of deal with those kinds of issues. But again, I do go back to, to Plato and I was really quite struck and I, I need guidance from you as the experts and Paul may be one to come in on that. Does, does Plato get it right? Or should we actually say we can't, we certainly can't deal with that. One thing he did say, you know, I was struck by this and again, not as a, not as an expert on Plato. What he said about the tyrant once the tyrant is in power. I thought this was extraordinary. What he actually says, and I was going to paraphrase that, that the tyrant mistrusts both those within and outside his circle, and so essentially ends up in a sort of servitude himself. And he recognizes that he's always in danger and sees plots everywhere. I thought it was a brilliant, wonderful phraseology. And all I could think of then was Donald Trump in the White House between 2016 and 2020. Now, there's many other things I would like to say. I want to say a few things about Thucydides and the Peloponnesian Wars and whether 
Uh, we've got, we learn from that. I think there's one thing we do learn from Thucydides about power transitions and why I think what he said about the origins of the Peloponnesian Wars does have some very, very important relevant, relevance for us today, thinking about the relationship between China and the United States. And I think, again, here there are other things we can learn, not mechanically or in any silly way, but in, in a sense of drawing certain ways of uh, analyzing the current contemporary international situation. So with those few very broad and general uh, comments, Paul, uh, I'll hand it back to you. Thanks very much for listening. Thank you very much, Mick, and thank you to, to the other panelists. We have some questions coming in and uh, we'll go to those in just a moment. The one obs observation that I just wanted to to um, run past both Simon and Johanna, um, in your different ways, you, you um, kind of bring things back to the LSE. And Simon, Simon makes the very good point about you know, Plato and expertise and so on. And of course, a former professor here um, in his great 1945 war work, you know, made a big point about you know, the dangers of that view, Karl Popper, um, and saw you know, Plato was on the side of the totalitarians. One of the interesting things about Popper, though, of course, is he doesn't, he doesn't, he's not against experts. So in, in your example, he's kind of keen on the shoemaker's expertise and the, probably the, the ship's captain. He's just a bit worried about the expert. And that matters kind of for, for the LSE's remit, because of course we were founded as a school of the social sciences in one way, um, linking to Joanna's point, as, as a kind of successor of the Philhellenes that had helped establish University College up the road. People like Jeremy Bentham, George Grote, and so on, who, who, who drew on the Greeks to kind of tame democracy rather than celebrate it, in, in the sense of your idea of, of, you know, politics from the ground up. They were very keen on um, anything but that. And what comes out of that, of course, is, is our rather curious democracy, which, um, which isn't democratic, it's representative and was always intended to be, and was concerned with disciplining the masses. Um, probably only Jeremy Bentham of all that lot who did fund or contributed to the, to the loan, um, was the only one who genuinely believed in equal vote and equal participation of everybody women and, and even people who were, were, were minimally educated. But it's kind of interesting that, you know, this, this issue about expertise and democracy persists. And the Greeks are both a, a, a kind of source for that. And in the, you know, the crude Western civ sense are, are um, you know, the, the source of our great values of democracy, et cetera, et cetera. But they're also the source of our critique of that. And, you know, both of you have, have kind of given us that, you know, the value of doing the whole thing is, is a check to the enthusiasms that others bring to contemporary politics because they've, you know, they've read Plato's Republic and a little bit of Thucydides in their first year at university, probably with, with me. So do you want to, make a, a, a response to that or to any of the other points raised by the other panelists before I open up. We still have time for the, for the questions. Joanna, do you want to? Yeah, sure, I think that the, the points that, that you raised and that Simon raised really intersect them with the questions of what the role of education is in a democracy. And this is one refrain that we hear in the United States is the need for a more robust, just better quality, longer lasting civics education. But I think that this also raises a, an important point that kind of often gets lost in the idealism over Athenian democracy are really two points. And the first, which I sort of alluded to and others have also is that it wasn't always the case that the constitutional systems that we have right now were framed as democracies in Athenian lines, right? So when the framers came up with a constitution, the, the idea was not in any way to replicate Athenian democracy precisely for the concerns about populism that Simon, um, Simon raised. Um, and that it sort of the way that we talk about ourselves as a society wasn't cast in terms of democracy really until the 20th century. And I think that Professor Cox, I'm sure could weigh in on this, 
where there's a very entangled history there between um, US and British intervention in Greece during the Greek Civil War and this sort of celebration, you know, a really kind of attendant ideological celebration of Athens, of Greece as the cradle of democracy that the West needed to save for itself because it was its origin story. Um, so those, I think, maybe those are just the points that, that I'll make so as not to take up all the time, but. Perhaps I could add just a, a, a small point. Of course, there's a, to follow Johanna, there's a famous remark from the Conservative uh, uh, Chancellor of the Exchequer back after the Reform Act in 1860s, when he was outraged that uh, so many people were getting the vote, he said, well, we'll have to educate our masters, which I thought was uh, an interesting way of putting that. Um, I think the difficulty with populism is that we're going to, I'm sure, I mean, this is better than anybody, if it's just democracy we don't like, I think we're underselling the danger of populism. Because populism goes, at least in the form in which we see it, is not simply the wrong party winning, but a form of democracy that does something to dissent. So if one was to take the example of Hungary or Poland today and seeing what it does to the legal system, the control of the media, the, as it were, the tyrant's playbook, as it's sometimes said. It's the ability not just to get into power, but to attempt to hold power by the crushing of dissent. Mm. And that seems to me to be something slightly different from just the wrong people getting in. But um, the other thing I would say is the sheer competence that Mick raised, which is a very, very interesting question. Of course, I'm sure he doesn't mean at least the trains run on time, because that's a rather awkward sort of place to go in terms of democracy, because we know what that means. But it is indeed a question of what the levers of change are. And that's a really difficult question. And that's where we get the most interesting part about who pulls the levers and who knows what the levers are and who should be judging those levers. And that's the real, the real heart of the matter for, for me. So I'm happy to, to, to think about competence but competence doesn't take away instrumentality at the one level or indeed governance, which is a different issue. And that's what I'll say at the moment, because I think. Nick, do you want to just? Well, I, I was going to jump in on the LSE question just very, very briefly about oh. founders, our four founders, mm. Webbs, uh, GB Shaw and Graham Wallace. Mm. Um, I, I don't think they were, I can't find much democratic, really, frankly, in, 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 in either Beatrice or Sydney. I mean, if you look at the origin, they were quite clear. It was, it was expertise. It was competent. It was those who could teach people about railways, about uh, accountancy. And nothing wrong with that. Mm. Uh, but, but democracy, I think, was fairly low down on their, on their scale. And we all know, don't we, Paul? And this is one of the embarrassments, of course, the of me looking into the history of the LSE, but everybody knows the story. In the 1930s, our two webs who founded the LSE, fine Fabians, no doubt, ended up as apologists for the Soviet Union uh, in their wonderful books, on the, well, not so wonderful books on civilization. So yeah, I mean, there's absolutely no, no doubt about that. On the populism question, very, very briefly, Simon, let me get back to you, I agree with you. There is a real danger posed by populism. I, I wouldn't doubt that for a minute. And we've seen that illustrated, as you've said, in Hungary, and we've certainly seen that illustrated in the in the United States. I suppose my response to you is not to deny your point. It is to say that those who got elected on platforms we would call broadly speaking populist addressed issues, if I might use the term, that ordinary people felt very strongly about. Mm. And I think it's therefore extraordinarily important, therefore, what I call more mainstream politicians, whether mainstream Republican or mainstream liberal or mainstream social democratic to at least accept that there were some genuine problems out there that required addressing. And there, I think, is where we lay today, Paul. Thank you. Well, we've got some good questions coming in. So let me let me start with 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 those. Um, firstly, from Andrew Dismore, um, assembly member in London. Uh, a former MP and LSE alumnus. Um, when Mayor Boris Johnson claimed to be a modern Pericles, unlike the Parthenon, BJ's achievements were the loss-making Mittal Tower and the unused cable car and unbuilt garden bridge. Given his shifting positions, alliances and demagoguery, I told him he was more like Alcibiades. Do you agree? Who wants to 
<laughs> yes and no. Unfortunately, I think he'd be jolly happy to be a bit like Al Sabatini. <laughs> that's a, that's a, a separate issue. Uh, and one shouldn't forget that uh, the Parthenon did go way over budget and caused all sorts of financial problems. I mean, this is a long <laughs> history. <laughs> so, Joanna, do you want to short response on that? That's okay, thank you. Okay. All right. Then uh, let me turn to uh, a second question um, from British Chandra Srivastava from Central University of Haryana in India. A question for, for Mick. Um, do you think this is true that, demo do you think it's true that democracy exists today in the world? And when news comes from all around the world uh, and that vo voters are mobilized by social uh, media, print media, et cetera, does that have an impact on democracy? Well, so, there's, there's no, on the social media, I mean, I can only repeat what I think is, has been said by so many other people. I mean, social media both has an extraordinarily liberating and enlightening quality. And I don't think there's any doubt about that, but the way that social media has been deployed and used, as we know over the last few years, particularly over the last four years, has been to undermine the very concept of truth, has been to undermine the very concept of what is a fact. And whether anybody ever, you know, anticipated this, I, I doubt it. it is the old law of unanticipated consequences, but we can't abolish it. I mean, we can't, we can't move into a, an age where there's no longer social media. The question is though, and this has been certainly being raised in Australia at the moment as to what degree these great big tech giants who are the platforms for this, to what degree should they be controlled, to what degree should they be regulated, and in what ways can we regulate these extraordinarily vast uh, powerful yeah. institutions. I remember many, many years ago, uh, President Eisenhower on his, in his farewell address in 61 talked about the overwhelming power of the military industrial complex, if you remember in 60, 61, when he left office. I mean, I, I wonder if somebody could also raise the same sorts of questions about these wonderful, these extraordinary platforms with all their great power. So they open up space for research, they open up space for debate, they open up space for democracy. But like any technology, it has a dark underside. And I think we've got to accept that there are both sides to it. Whether we can do anything about it, Paul, I'm not so sure. Can I add a, a one half a point to that? Uh, I'm not so sure about the space for democracy. It's often said that it, the, the, the social media is democratic and what most people mean by that is anybody can go on it. But the <laughs> democracy actually depends on ecclesia and, and judgment making. It depends on having discussion that is a genuine debate followed by genuine decision making. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what social media does not provide. Not mm -hmm. only by providing bubbles where people hear the same thing again and again without any dissent, in my interest in dissent, but also decision making is not there. And so I think it's a profoundly undemocratic, although it is profoundly of the demos. And that's, uh, <laughs> I think that's worth holding on to as a distinction. Um, uh, and people mistake the circulation of information as a democratic process, it's not. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So I have a question directly for um, Joanna. Um, and this comes from Stephanie Wong from Brown University. Providence, Rhode Island. Um, Home team. What do you think of recent conversations in the academy, uh, re-burn it all down discourse and Western civilization? Do you think these lessons from modern geopolitics should inform the way we teach and learn about Western democracy? Uh, thank you very much, Stephanie, for asking a very pertinent question. So um, I believe that Stephanie is referring to when she says burn it all down. This is a sort of slogan that has been circulating, particularly with reference to the, you, we could call it the classical industrial complex um, that there is. And, and this is something that I had wanted to address in, in my remarks, but in only 10 minutes, there was only so much. But I think that, of course, these narratives about sort of Western civilization and that arc that I suggested from the heights of the Pnyx right to the, to the end of history, this is something that is so sort of embroiled in how or interconnected with how we think about ancient Greece as, as culture heroes. Um, those narratives are deeply connected with the way that modern Greece is framed in the media, is framed in economic, political policy, but it's also very much implicated in the way that the field of classics works, the way that the classics are taught, the way that the field itself can alienate, can exclude. 
And so I think that these things are all, all sort of hinging off this spine of the Western civilization narrative that needs so much rethinking and needs so much reorienting in a way that will allow you know, the whole world of antiquity to be reframed, to become accessible, to become more inclusive. And I think we'll have sort of various effects in, in terms of turning around this legacy of Phil Hellenism, which has, has a sort of the, a regrettable side, certainly. Uh, will involve sort of reshaping how the textbook narratives are presented. And I think that once that starts to fragment and come apart, the field itself stands a better chance of, um, uh, of, of, of thriving, really, that these kinds of conversations will be able to go forward in a more robust and more diverse way. Thank you. Simon. Yeah, well, I absolutely agree with Johanna that classics historically has been, of course, complicit with all sorts of sexist, racist, imperialist arguments, particularly in the 19th century. I always have to add a, a qualifier to that, which is going to have another qualifier afterwards. The first qualifier is it's absolutely crucial to the Renaissance, to the rediscovery of the past, the change of that. It's crucial to Marx and the political revolution, to Shelley and political revolution. It's crucial to Freud and sexual revolution. It's crucial to Foucault and to Derrida, intellectual revolution. So there's no doubt that classics can be used for revolution. That's my first, and there's no reason not to do so. But this is my qualification to my qualification, that doesn't stop it being, an, uh, as it were, insufficient if you don't now look back and see what the past has done and try and change it. So there's a great deal of injunction to be, not to try and reconstruct the past as a simple direct genealogy, either for good or bad, but to recognize the work that's been done over these years and to recognize the impact it has, as Joanna said, on real lives and see how you're gonna change that. And the discipline that doesn't change, that isn't aware of its own past and can't change, is a dead discipline. And I don't think classics is a dead discipline, although it works on dead languages. I think it's an extremely active and extremely robust discipline, but it will only remain so if it can deal with the current difficulties it has about exclusion and inclusion. But it doesn't help to write the past as if it was always the same thing. Well, I mean, if I might, though, quickly, Simon, I think it's important to, to disentangle, I mean, or to at least attempt to the, the discipline itself and the disciplinary structures itself and the, the sort of university frameworks and how admissions work and all these kinds of things, the way that, you know, official textbooks or narratives are presented, which it, in a way is a complicator to my, my earlier point about education, the necessary of education and democracy, right? So it's a whole sort of um, can of worms there. But to disentangle the sort of disciplinary structures from, you know, the archive of material which the discipline sort of takes as its object even though of course the discipline has shaped that archive yeah. right certainly that you know when we look at an OCT an Oxford classical text of Thucydides as Peloponnesian War today that 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 text is is not sort of you know um unencumbered by a history of you know politicized interventions in the text um, that I, I think that there, there is a the the sort of burn it all down slogan, which I think oftentimes gets um, kind of misinterpreted. Um, I think that that uh, really is is calling upon professional classes, as classes to to really rethink these sort of disciplinary structures right now, mm -hmm. to open up those archives for more people. Could I ask a question, either of Simon or Johanna? It seems to me that. Uh... Classical studies are, are kind of riding a wave at the moment, are they? I mean, Tom Holland sells in are the. They? <laughs> Mary, Mary Beard is yeah. our family's hero. You know, I mean, I don't remember this 10, 15, 20 years ago. And I'm, I'm just interested to get your take on this because, you know, the popularization of so many of the. And also, you mentioned Thucydides, which I briefly touched upon. I won't go into the game. But I mean, he still taught in Naval War College in the United States, badly or otherwise, I don't know. Uh, Chinese, of course. I teach him there, so I, it's impeccable. Oh, oh, you know, I'm sure it's absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 you guys are riding a wave at the moment, I would have thought. On, on it, it's not. I don't think I, there's any doubt that the, the interest in classics is extremely broad. The interest in ancient Greece, yeah. so whether it's Disney and Heracles or <laughs> Jackson for kids or all the way up, there's an interest. But what Johanna says is right, that, you know, like every other institution, classics has not transcended the racism of its own mm. time. Mm. And it has to transcend it if it's going to do it. It has to show itself willing to do so. It's mm. not transcended. I mean, there was a time when it certainly hadn't transcended the sexism of its own time. It's now mm. trying to do those things. So there's no doubt that institutionally, like most universities and most departments, there's a lot of work to do. And it's a double whammy because classics is so tied up with the Western idea of itself. And mm. so, you know, that sort of thought really has to go into it to, to what we're doing and why we're doing it and who we're doing it for. Mm. But 
that's the sign of a discipline doing its job properly, both institutionally and intellectually. And I think the people who are resisting it are people who aren't thinking very hard about that problem. That's all. So can I just follow up on that briefly? Uh, perhaps to Joanna first. I mean, obviously, I mean, we know there's this sort of backlash. We saw it with Black Lives Matter in particular, and here it's all this preoccupation with not pulling down statues. But, but as you have this move, necessary movement to reform, transform, um, enlighten your own disciplined fields and so on in the way some, do you, do you have institutional backlash about against that you know is there is there a growing rear guard for you know western civ traditionally understood save our values and our, our world view or is that is that ultimately dead i mean um, this is about is, is that a straw man argument is that what you're asking paul in a way well, i just wondered you know are there, is there pushback within the academy as well as <coughs> well, well i think that the, the question of within the academy i mean the universities and colleges all have their own sort of personality. Um, so I think that though it's also hard to isolate the academy from <clears throat> society as a whole, right? Because you, you you have to think about who the kinds of people who make large donations, right? Who fund chairs, who fund programming. And I think that it, at least in the United States, I've certainly witnessed witnessed a, a, a significant a significant backlash against the moves to to open up the field to start looking more at a global ancient Mediterranean, at global antiquities, to really welcome and embrace uh, classical reception as a, as a legitimate part of the, of the scientific discipline. So I think that there, there certainly is, is quite a lot of resistance and the claim always being that some worry that that Latin you know, and Greek will sort of no longer really be learned in the same way as they used to be. I mean, I can see that that ship has already sailed really. So I think that there's, there's a real impetus now to do um, exactly. I think what Simon was suggesting is to, to capitalize on there is this, this public interest in the ancient material. And I think that it's really incumbent upon the, the, the experts or the people who aspire to be experts or stylize themselves as ex experts um, to really engage on a, on a, in, in a way that's, um, that's very inclusive around that material, critical, smart. Um, Joe Lepore, the American historian, is just absolutely fantastic on the way that the American his professional historians retreat from sort of biography from, you know, what you might think of as more popularizing history, created this space for the radicalization of, of sort of American history narratives in the hands of groups like the Tea Party. And I think that to a certain extent, classic can be in danger of, of that. Um, so I think that we are at a, a real juncture where it, things could go very much either way and there's an opportunity to be had. I mean, the reason um, I ask, of course, is we have well, a government which is led by a prime minister who you know, models himself on Pericles, but has ministers in there who criticize, I mean, Foucault got a, got a mention from our Secretary of State for uh, international trade and so on. So there's, there's that culture war element. Uh, Simon, do you want to just... Well, I just think... <sighs> Johanna's absolutely right when she says that there are certainly forces of conservatism, as you might call them, who want things, nothing to change because that's what conservatism wants usually. But I think the, the word I would put in place instead of that is not so much cultural war as responsibility. It seems to me that inertia is one of the, the bad things. That you're, I, for me, the, what happens in departments is just business as usual, and that's an inadequate response to responsibility. So I would want to just say um, that, yes, there's a lot of cultural wars, there's a lot of shouting and there's a lot of screaming, but actually what is incumbent is on everybody who is not doing something to think about their inertia about that. And right. that's the more interesting way of doing it. Let's move on because we've got some more questions. So we have a question from um, Robert Giorelli, uh, a visitor to LSE. And his question is, is the ostracism practice something to be revived in order to get rid of dangerous people as recognized by a majority of citizens and to mitigate um, the rise of the worst? Who would like to mm. comment on ostracism? I mean, it could be just yes or no. I mean, th th there's plenty of questions. So. Well, I'm, I'm speechless for once, uh, Paul, because I'm not quite sure what the question is really asking. <laughs> uh, go on. I'm not being rude to the to the question. I just am not quite sure. Well, if the difficulty is, it's a wonderful moment for my, my mixed thought about the wrong people voting. 
<laughs> isn't it? I mean, that's to say, if you were allowed to vote to kick someone out of the country, I yes. Mean, it's more, the first vote would probably be against a footballer. The second against, you know, it's, like, it's not clear as it were, we would get a, a, a yeah. point. It's, it's a, it was, I mean, it's often seen as a sort of way of letting off steam in democracy in ancient Athens. I don't know whether it works like that. And I no, can't I, I, it, I, it, it's, it <laughs> sounds like witch hunt to me, but I, I worry about that very, very, very much indeed. I don't know what Joanna thinks. Of, if it's all, uh, about reviving ostracism yeah, no. <laughs> no 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 i know right, right. i'm we've, glad you said we've got, that I, we've got we could do got, ostracism as long as it was only the three of us who got yeah it's only three of us as long as, <laughs> well, as, long, that, as long as it's not an arsenal footballer you, <laughs> yeah. so on that, let, let's 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 actually pick that question up because we have the question from uh, alexandros um spiridonos who is an lse alumni alumnus sorry my glasses on if we say that democracy is a good system as long as the right people win, who and how will judge the rightness of it? <laughs> well, I, I'm the one who kind of started that one off, didn't I, from my Northern Ireland experience, simply quoting what the economists said at the time, and it, it stuck in my mind so much. But yeah, it, it, it leaves us with a, with a big question. I, I have a very simple answer to that. I think it's a simple answer, maybe too simple. Um, you just other candidates come forward and put forward better arguments and come up with better ideas and address people's problems and address their issues and get get the people who have been in, in, in uh, who have been voted in voted out again I mean that seems to me the basic mechanism we have to use there's no other mechanism that we have Paul that would be my very obvious but banal answer to, to that actually a good question nonetheless. Mm -hmm. Democracy is the worst system of government, of course, except for all the others. And uh, who, said, who said that? Who said that? Churchill, wasn't it? Churchill. <laughs> yeah. okay. but not the, not uh, always the most democratic of politicians, I'll say, friend. Absolutely, absolutely right. Um, I would just like to I'd like to push back and just say actually the wrong side never wins. The mm. wrong side. That's not democratic to say that, but the, the mm. right side always wins. You get the government you deserve. And if you don't educate and you don't build and you don't put the right teams in place, you get what you deserve. Mm. So, yeah. Well, send your letter to the economist back in 1987. That's that's, yeah. that's how I remember it yes. in okay. my mind for so long. But I always, th I always think at a superficial level, you know, both Plato and, and, and Aristotle have something. If you could indeed find the most wise and the most virtuous person, why wouldn't you want to trust political power? The problem, of course, is finding that, isn't it? And believing that political power doesn't corrupt. Corrupt, exactly. But is but is your comment, Simon, that actually that's also a fool's errand? Because mm. because I think you know when when Pop, when Popper does his whole totalitarian Plato stuff, it's never quite clear whether he's making that point mm. or he's saying that actually you know the epist epistocratic argument that the epistemological focus is actually is more about you know, the, the whole sort of LSE Fabian thing about solving small problems, um, you know, piecemeal social engineering rather than the truth or, you know, the form of the good and all that kind of stuff, which is really something else. It's actually the bits and pieces, you know, it's getting the right person to make the shoes. Well, I think, the, the, I mean, as, as, as you well know, um, the question is not really, do we want to have experts as doctors? I mean, nobody is going to say we want an inexpert doctor. And if you want to build a bridge, you want an expert engineer. The question is, what sort of questions are liable to that sort of answer? And the question might be, um, is politics the sort of place where you can have that sort of expert? Mm. When it comes to decisions that involve interest and conflict between groups, it's a little harder to know who the expert on that is. You, you might also argue, Simon, it's, it's a point, the problem with politics today, it's become a profession. Mm. Um, it's become professionalized. We now have the phenomenon of the professional politician who is an expert politician, but is not reflected. This is certainly true in this country. I'm not so sure about other countries. I think it's true, Paul. In other words, it'd be much better if we did have representatives from all walks of life in politics. What they can then do, of course, is call upon experts, <laughs> whether economists or whoever, 
uh, to sort out some policies which they can't. But I'm very I much- I think Trump sort of made that argument for his own candidacy, didn't he? Say that again, I, Jonas. I mean, that, that Trump was not a professional politician and that was the virtue of- That was. His yeah, right. candidacy, wasn't that- yeah, I know. And the argument, the subject, argument against his me. His argument. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Of course, Plato has that done nicely too. In whatever it is, it's not expertise in business that you want and amongst your political rulers. I mean, it's a good sign. Make a good point when we when we conceive of what politics is. But if we think of government, you know, there is an issue of expertise, and it may not be that you want a, a, a you know a former general practitioner like Liam Fox as your health secretary. But you might want people who have had some experience relative to the role who are going to then lead um, you know, important parts of your government. And, and, and one of the things we tend to do now is we, you know, we, we, we move people around too fast. You know, the US system, for all its failings, gives the opportunity for the executive to appoint people to cabinet who might be expert in, in their field now doesn't follow that they always do that but it is at least possible to pick people from you know science backgrounds or people with with, with, with types of expertise so we've got government versus um you know politics okay think, just one question very quickly paul i mean do you think the covid pandemic with all of its huge downsides of course no point saying otherwise is there one little silver lining on this particular cloud which has brought back expertise back to the center. You know, in the end, you know, the scientists will disagree with us, at least they're disagreeing within a framework which we would call science. I wonder if that might be a benefit, at least one unintended but positive result of where, this whole COVID pandemic. I don't know what other people well, think. Ho well, hopefully, I mean, one, one issue, particularly domestically might be that, you know, we might end up with an education secretary who was at least a little bit interested in education <laughs> and how it's delivered, whether that's at the university mm. level or in schools. Mm. Rather than completely indifferent, you know, it's the, the competence is one thing, but indifference is 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 um, rather mm. more of a challenge. Okay, mm. let me mm. let me move on. So uh, I have another question from um, uh, Nicholas from KCL uh, for all the panelists. There's been much talk about having expertise, but what about being qualified? I understand that the two do not converge at a certain point, but enabling the populace to make an educated vote surely subtracts nothing from the right to have everyone vote. That is to say, democracy may not be under the scrutiny here, but, but the personnel involved within it, um, at voter level and at the vote, so presumably expertise, both amongst voters and those who are standing for office. Um, I'll allow somebody else to go first on that one, Paul, I think. Mm, I'm not sure I quite followed the question. I mean, mm. It's clear that everyone should be allowed to have the vote in democracy as everyone who is, is as we say, competent uh, in legal sense. And um, I don't think anybody is denying that the one person, one vote scheme should continue. Um, the question is, what are you voting on? You're voting on a person. And what is the expertise that you require of the person you're voting on? I mean, that is to say, if you think that it's a simple LSE style question, if MPs are going to make decisions about economics, how mathematically literate do they need to be? Mm. And why are we never testing politicians for their mathematical literacy? Yeah. If they're making decisions about foreign policy, as they do in Parliament, what expertise are they expected to have? And at the moment, the trouble about the professionalization of the politician is it's a professionalization without qualification or expertise. <laughs> <laughs> so, as far as one can tell, so <laughs> what are we voting on? So that would be my question. I don't understand why, I mean, when I vote for a politician, what am I voting for? Yeah, I mean, when you think, when you think of, of classic arguments like Mills with plural voting, mm -hmm. it's always about the qualification of the voters, it's never about the qualification. He doesn't address the qualification of the mm -hmm. representative who's being elected. Mm -hmm. um, who of course is exercising, well, in, in, in Mill's case, exercising judgment over the experts. That's the role. And we don't, yeah. we don't look at that. It's quite hard to evaluate between three economic policies as a decision if you have no economic competence. Indeed. 
Okay, um, I have a question here from Eve Tobin, who's a sixth form student from London. Um, nice sort of simple question. Um, how much support did Plato's Republic get from his contemporaries um, in terms of his ideas about democracy? Any, a lot, none? Well, we, it's an interesting question. Um, Plato obviously becomes the, a major philosopher for Christianity, becomes a major philosopher for political theory. So in that sense, later on, he becomes a major figure. Socrates is put to death in part because his pupils, of whom Plato was one, were directly involved in the oligarchic coup. Now, whether Plato's, <laughs> where you think that puts Plato in that particular discussion is another matter. I don't know what Johanna thinks, but I think he was probably an extremely elite thinker who had a decent amount of influence on some of his elite people, but was not, he, he didn't sell as many copies as Tom Holland. Let's put it like that. <laughs> <laughs> good, good. Well, Johanna. I would add too that there's there's a really wonderful political theorist at the University of Chicago, Dimitra Kassimis, who's who's currently working on right now on, on the way in which that the Republic as a dialogue cultivates this sort of error, this conspiratorial error to the, the dramatic mm -hmm. setting of the scene down mm -hmm. at the Piraeus, this, this sort of yeah. illicit conversation. And I think that that literary frame around the dialogue is something that that it's sort of we don't you know have you know these these kind of um, extensive elaborate direct reactions to the Republic from you know about the time that we think that it would have been in circulation, but I think that that it should be cast in the the way that Cassimis describes it as this this sort of air of conspiracy and illicitness does tell you something about the way it's it's sort of its perception is being steered or or, or driven or that. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, let me move on. I have one further question. Um, uh, this has come through from uh, Facebook, so I don't have the name, but is the lesson from history that no political or social dispensation lasts forever? And that the time when we think we've reached the end of history is just the point of inflection before everything is about to change? bit of Hegel in there, I think. Well, a uh, bit of Hegel, a bit of Koyev, and of course, quite a lot of Fukuyama thrown in there. Now, I, I, Nick, on. well, sorry, just to jump in quickly. Um, but that term end of history, we, I mean, it, it certainly sold well, didn't it? It seemed to summarize something. Uh, it caught the, caught the atmosphere of, of the time. Um, the prediction that this would therefore be the unalloyed victory of political and economic liberalism going forward for at least another well epoch has proven to be a rather rather a silly prediction to have made. I, I suppose what I'd say, Paul, and I don't know what others would want to say about this. And this is about Fukuyama himself. Um, if you actually read Fukuyama as opposed to kind of quote him occasionally, which people do, he actually says something slightly more complicated than that. May, this may also get back to all the even greater Greek thinkers that have been talked about by Joanna and Simon, because I actually did read it very, very carefully. I think I did read it very carefully. And actually it ends up rather pessimistically. Oh, yeah. uh, it is, it, it is not a, it's triumphalist only if you read it in a certain triumphal way, but it isn't really a triumphalist document. That's why I read it. Yeah, it's, it's, it's more it's Nietzsche than become Nietzsche. very boring. And there's all sorts of un unpleasant things out there which are still going to make the world very highly conflictual, uh, highly problematic, including nationalism. He, he mentioned that, by the way, as one of the, the great things. And you could actually say, therefore, he got something very profoundly right. But So I, I don't like endism uh, as, a, a, as an argument. And I'm not even sure Hegel, going back to Hegel, thought of it as endism. Marx certainly didn't think of it as endism. And he knew a thing or two about Hegel. But I don't know. I would defer to... Simon's views on that, or Joanna's, to get their views on this. Joanna. I mean, we're talking about bicentennials nominally, in a way. Yeah. Uh, I mean, what is that? It's it's the blink of an eye, right? Even in in <laughs> the sort of arc of history, in as much as you you know we understand it or pretend to understand it today, if you if you look at the Roman Empire from its sort of stirrings to the fall of Constantinople in 1453. Right, you have eight or ten times the amount of time that we're talking about in terms of bicentennials. So, 
I mean, uh, nothing has lasted forever yet, I guess, is what my response would be. I would add one little point to that, because Jan is absolutely right that nothing has lasted. We have historical evidence for this. But I would say what, what the implications of that are are quite interesting. So much of planning, so much of politics has a platonically idealist view, which I think we can include for Hegel and for Marx, even if they're not endless, they right, can be idealist. Mm. It seems to me one of the hardest but most necessary things to do when you're doing political planning or governance is to build in change and contingency and mess. And actually to think, I mean, you know, planning for change is a very hard thing to do because you don't know where it's going to come from, what's going to be. Planning for mess looks ridiculous because you don't plan, you, you mess is the opposite of planning. But actually you need to have that sort of sense of flexibility in a system, that sense of knowingness rather than knowledge, that sense of openness rather than closeness. And that's what's so hard to do. And I think that's what the question is really about. Mm. It's not about, you know, does a system last, but how do you plan? How do you mm. think if you know that something isn't going to last? What are the next steps? And that to me is what the difference between, as it were, the naive political rhetoric and a more mature political governance. Paul, couldn't I ask you a question? Isn't, isn't it in essence, that's what Popper's driving at? The, the, the not contingency, but the open-endedness. You've got to just take your views Precise. on the yeah, yeah. That's, yeah. I think you know, the whole totalitarian discourse is wholly inappropriate in talking about someone like Plato but it but his concern is this contrast with a you know with an overarching right answer mm. which would somehow close and the reality of knowledge acquisition which is kind of piecemeal bit by bit constant revision and so on so you know there is a problem solving and a progressive element in the sense of being able to improve things but there's no history there's no mm. no narrative of how you know history's going and therefore you know something that will carry us rather than us having to do some pretty hard work along the way um i mean could, so. could i just mention very quickly also coming back to professor cox had, had raised thucydides earlier one of the the really extraordinary things that i i you know think is 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 very strong in, in the history of the peloponnesian war is that the athenians even during their most jingoistic imperialistic speeches make gestures at their own knowledge that their empire will not last forever. That happens mm. in the Melian dialogue. Mm. Heracles does it. I mean, Thucydides says right, right at the start, you know, when if someone, if these empires should fall one day, people will think that Athens was much more powerful than it was because they'll see these ruins um, compared to Sparta will have nothing of the built environment to last. So I, I think that that, mm. that is a sort of interesting thing that it's already packaged in the history of the Peloponnesian War, the yeah. Athenians thinking outside or beyond their, their own power. And also, Joanna, just to pick up on that point very briefly, because I know the time is going out. Actually, there's a huge tradition now, I suppose, going back to Edward Gibbon's decline and fall of, 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 the, of the, you know, the short duration of empires. I mean, how many books have been written over now in the last 40, 50, 60 years on the rise and fall of something? Going back to Gibbon through Toynbee, Paul Kennedy's work of 1987. You know, so I think there is built in, I think, at least with the, with the better historians, and an acceptance of decay, of decline, and, and, and ultimate disappearance from the state of history. Mm. It's a happy note to finish on. <laughs> so with optimistic the, note, yeah. <laughs> we're all we're all we're all dead in the long term. Isn't it? Yes. So can, I, can I can I thank all the speakers um, at today's session? Can I thank Joanna Hannick, um, Simon Goldhill, um, Mick Cox from the LSE? Um, can I thank everyone who's joined us? There are many many questions that we could have had if 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 um, time was not running against us. Um, but it's been very good to have so many people engaged. Um, I'd like to say um, we have future events coming up and there's one that I would like to announce um, from the uh, Hellenic Observatory, which is the um, uh, Shaping Cities for an Urban Age. Um, and the speaker will be Ricky Burdett, Professor of Urban Studies at LSE and Director of LSE Cities. Um, and the discussants will be um, Kostas Okayanis, the mayor of Athens, um, Lila Leon Taidu, um, professor emerita of geography and European culture at the Hellenic Open University, and George Petrakos, an economist, um, professor at the Department of Planning 
and Regional Development at the University of Thessaly. Uh, planning uh, is complicated with uh, cities, let alone uh, uh, in this sort of global historical perspective. So with that, um, can I thank everybody um, and wish everybody who's joined us today well, wherever they are and for what they're doing, and hopefully see them back at an LSE event in the future. Thank you all.